الحمد للہ رب العالمین و صلی اللہ وسلم علی نبینا محمد و علی و صحبہ و سلم اما بعد حبت فی اللہ Continue on in our study of the book of uh, marriage, Kitab al uh, in Bulugh Maram, and we were discussing some of the prohibited types of nikah. And we've reached the hadith, the first hadith, which speaks about al muta And this is a type of marriage, as we'll see, which is prohibited in Islam. And Ahlul Sunnah has no disagreement about this. So, in the 848th hadith, narrated uh, Salama, or Salama bin, uh, bin al-Aqwa, radiyallahu ta'ala an, قال, he said, in the year of uh, Utas, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, permitted al-Muta' which is the temporary marriage, for three nights. Then he prohibited it afterwards, reported by a Muslim. So this is a hadith in Sahih Muslim, which refers to the muta. And in this hadith, we see that uh, according to uh, uh, Salama ibn al-Aqwa, radiyallahu ta'ala an, that in the year of al-Utas, that the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam uh, allowed for the muta, and this was a practice which was from the time of Jahiliyyah and carried over into Islam for a limited period uh, for the maslaha of the uh, of the ummah at that time and we'll get into those uh, more details as we look at the ahadith. First, understanding the muta. So, the muta, as we mentioned, is one of the uh, forbidden types of marriage. Muta is a marriage that is abrogated. It was abrogated. A muta marriage is a temporary marriage to a woman for a period such as two, three uh, days, a month, or such. And even some practice, people practice it for an hour, whatever the case may be. There is no dispute regarding the fact that muta marriage was formerly lawful in Islam. So there's no dispute about this. And as we see from this hadith, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa, verse uh, 24, So with those of whom you have enjoyed sexual relations, give them their mahar as prescribed. Uh, it was reported on the authority of Abdullah bin Mas'ud that he said we were fighting in the battle with the Prophet وسلم, and we had no women with us. So we said to the Messenger وسلم, shall we castrate ourselves? But the Prophet وسلم, forbade us to do that and thenceforth he allowed us to marry a woman temporarily by giving her even a garment and then he recited O you who believe do not make unlawful the good things which Allah has made lawful to you. Uh, and this is in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 87. Uh, and this hadith was an authentic hadith which mentioned this. Imam Shafi'i said regarding uh, the muta and regarding this hadith, he said, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala mentioned castration, but he did not mention anything which indicates whether it was before Khaybar or after it. So it appears that the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib in which the Prophet وسلم, prohibited muta uh, marriage, abrogated it, uh, meaning the hadith of uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Therefore, it is not permissible to contract a muta marriage in any circumstances. And that was the statement of Imam al-Shafi'i. Uh, the prohibition of muta has been mentioned and reported on six occasions. One, the first being in uh, Al Khaybar, the Battle of Khaybar. The second, during uh, uh, Umrah al, al Qada. The third being the year of the conquest of Mecca. And the fourth, the year of uh, Utas, which is the uh, in reference to the hadith we were just mentioning. 
and the fifth is the Battle of Tabuk, and the sixth is during the farewell uh, pilgrimages. The farewell, the farewell pilgrimage. And although there is some difference of opinion about some of the authenticity of some of those ahadith, we have authentic hadith, as is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam forbade this practice of the temporary marriage. And this is, as we mentioned, when uh, a person, uh, and which is still practiced under the Shia uh, theology, that they practice um, this temporary marriage. And in the case, as we see, according to this hadith, mentioned that they gave uh, a garment so that there was some sort of uh, dowry or some sort of mahar, but the other aspects of nikah were not in place. And likewise, the, the asl of this marriage is that it was just a contract for a temporary um, marriage, if you will. And thus the name, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, al-muta, muta referring to enjoyment. So the muta marriage is like the marriage, a temporary marriage of enjoyment. And Islam has forbid that practice in accordance with the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the next hadith, the 849th hadith, narrated Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala, and this is the hadith we were referring to, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade al-muta, the temporary marriage, in the year of al-khaybar. This is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, which states that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade this practice, the practice of uh, al-muta. In the next hadith, and then we'll talk about some of the benefits of these hadith in general, uh, narrated Ali radiallahu ta'ala on the battle of Khaybar, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade the temporary marriage, the muta, of women and eating the flesh of domestic donkeys. Uh, as Saba except Abu Dawood reported it. So in this hadith it has the addition that the Prophet والسلام, forbade the eating of donkeys, uh, the flesh of, uh, of domesticated donkeys. In the next hadith, the 851st hadith, Narrated Rabi ibn Sabra on the authority of his father, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I had permitted to you the temporary marriage of women, but Allah has now prohibited you from that till the day of uh, resurrection. So if anyone has any of these women in temporary marriage, he should let her go and do not take back anything of what you have given them. Reported by Muslim, Abu Dawood, An nisai Ibn Majah, Ahmed, and Ibn Hiban. So, in this hadith, this hadith here illustrates for us the, uh, also the, uh, that muta uh, was for forbidden. All of those hadith that we mentioned in this chapter, they talked about when the Prophet ﷺ allowed it, and they talked about the Prophet ﷺ prohibiting it, letting us know that this is a prohibited practice, and especially because most of these hadith that are mentioned here in Bulugha Maram are hadith that are either in, uh, that are in Muslim, or they are mutafakun alayhi, they are in Bukhari and Muslim, which we don't doubt their authenticity. So we have a, a lot of evidence to illustrate that this practice was a practice for a limited period of time, uh, and this practice was legislated during the time of jihad, when the Sahaba uh, were in battle, and so and that they had a need for this. And again, it was in the early stages of Islam. And so that this practice allowed for them, instead of them resorting to radiallahu ta'ala anu majma'in, akramakum Allah, resorting to castration as was mentioned, and they asked even about this. They were willing 
to castrate themselves in order to preserve their honor, in order to not fall into zina in case of or, or other sins. And this shows us that castration was not an option. Likewise, uh, and of course zina was not an option, but the muta, which was a pre-Islamic practice, was allowed for a temporary amount of time. And that it was, uh, that they gave uh, what we learned from this, uh, a couple of those ahadith mentioned for us, that they gave a garment or something like this, so that there was a type of mahar, a type of dowry. Some of the main benefits of this hadith is this shows that the muta is a prohibited practice and that this is from uh, you know we, we understand this prohibition because all of these hadith, hadith were discussing the prohibition of the muta of this practice that this was a practice allowed in uh, the beginning of Islam but was prohibited and there is some disagreement about when exactly it was prohibited Another benefit of these uh, hadith is that they illustrate for us that it is not possible that uh, this type of marital practice would be allowed again because the Prophet والسلام, said in one of those uh, hadith, in the last hadith, he said, Ila yawm al -qiyama. He said, until the day of resurrection or the day of judgment meaning that it was prohibited it will be prohibited for you until the day of judgment so this lets us know from the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that this practice of the muta is prohibited and it will not be revived it will not be allowed after that time of its prohibition and this is until yom al qiyamah so letting us know that it is a prohibited practice and it would not return it would not be a practice which would be allowed even though some sects, uh, mainly the Shia, and perhaps some extreme Sufi sects, uh, practice this, uh, this, these types of practices. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us that if someone makes a contract of some sort, regardless of whether it's marriage or uh, a business contract, in which the act is facet, meaning the, the contract itself is um, illegitimate, that it is not a, a legitimate contract. There is something in it which, negate, which goes against the sharia, the asl in the sharia or the maqasid or the maqsid of the uh, the intention of the the contract then if this is a, uh, a illegitimate contract then the person uh, then it's obligation it's an obligation to remove oneself from that uh, from that con from that contract and from that situation so this is one of the benefits we gain from this hadith also from uh, the hadith prior to this it also shows us that the domestic uh, the domestic donkey uh, their meat is prohibited that it is impermissible to eat uh, from this meat and of course unless there is some absolute dorora there is some uh, something some absolute necessity and this falls under the ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem حُرِمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالْدَمُّ وَالْحَمُّ الْخَنْزِيرُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and it has been prohibited for you uh, that which is dead meaning not killed by the shar' killed uh, Islamically properly and blood and uh, the uh, and pork and so all of those things are prohibited uh, unless 
it's out of necessity, and that goes to the rest of the ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ اَتْتَرَى فِي مُخَمَّسَةٍ غَيْرَ مُتَجَانِفٍ لِإِثْمٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and lets us know that unless it becomes a necessity, then if it becomes a necessity, then there's no sin, and verily Allah is the uh, most forgiving, most uh, merciful. So this lets us know that in the Baroda, in the absolute necessity, is when it is permissible to, of course, partake in those, uh, you know, in that which is in accordance with what will uh, keep someone sustain their life. Not meaning, for example, if someone is starving and then they just enjoy, for example, a whole pig or they indulge, you know, and drink alcohol or, or what have you uh, to uh, till they become drunk or whatever the case may be. But it, rather it's in, in, a, in accordance with the haja, with the nasib, with the necessity of staying alive. What is necessary to prevent one from being, uh, from dying. So it would just be what is permissible is to eat just what is sufficient to uh, prevent one from being, uh, from being harmed, uh, dying or sick or what have you. Those are just some of the main benefits of this, uh, of these, this group of hadith uh, with regards to the muta. In the next hadith, narrated Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu tana'in, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cursed the man who made a woman lawful for her first husband, and the one for whom she was made lawful, the men involved in the halala. Reported by Ahmed, a Nisa'i, and a Tirmidhi, the latter declared it to be sahih or authentic, Al Arba, except Nisa'i, reported it, uh, so reported something related to this matter, on the authority of Ali radiyallahu tala'in. This hadith is another example of the types of nikah which are uh, impermissible and, in fact. Uh, illegitimate meaning that the nikah itself does not take place and this is the situation a uh, halala means to marry a divorced woman temporarily with the intention of making her <coughs> remarriage to her former husband lawful this act is unlawful marriage based on intended divorce is unlawful whether its period is prescribed or not so, in this type of marriage, there is a, 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 a type of resemblance when you look at that definition uh, with the muta, with the uh, temporary marriage, and that it's temporary that the parties have agreed to a specific uh, time and uh, to, to be married to one another. And this can be uh, a time period of 20 minutes to one day to three days to a month what have you but the fact is that they stipulated a time period or time frame uh, to have this uh, to enjoy one another a muta just to just mainly for the uh, the sexual relations Allah, and so forth without the responsibility the true responsibility of marriage and maintaining a marriage and maintaining the uh, and, and, and going with the Sharia maqsad or the Sharia intention of, uh, of Nikah. And so uh, the Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith of Abdul, uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala, قال لعن رسول الله or Ibn Mas'ud said this, said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لعن Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-muhallal wa muhallal so the prophet sallallahu wa muhallalahu so the prophet alayhi salatu wa salam is reported by uh, ibn mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala 
he cursed the one who uh, made a woman lawful for her first husband and the one for whom she was made lawful meaning the men uh, uh, involved in this so basically anyone who has this intention that they fit under this description of being cursed that someone arranged a situation or the woman what it happened and as it was related to me in a real situation where a sister had been divorced three times and then she had multiple suitors who wanted to marry her then she decided that she uh, you know she decided she wanted to be with her first husband who had divorced her three times and he obviously had this desire as well so she married uh, an individual a brother and with that intention that she would go back to her uh, to her ex to her her husband so the in individual who married with her in the second marriage was unaware of this so the ones who fit under the description and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best is those ones with the intention to involve themselves in this meaning the the woman because she intended she just married just for uh, just to make herself lawful for her first husband which is the exact meaning of this hadith the exact thing this hadith warns against and then the husband the or the first husband if he was aware of this you know if he was aware of this this type of situation and this shows us the danger of such a scenario another example would be that sometimes this happens Wallahu musta'an and there are real scenarios we're not speaking just from uh, just a, an example we're just making up or giving you real scenarios that happen and a situation in which a woman is divorced by her husband for whatever the situation may be and it is a third uh, divorce so or perhaps it's not even the well in this situation to be the fit under this description it would need to be uh, a situation where at least the idda has uh, finished or which then they could do a, a, a new nikah a new marital contract if it was just one divorce or two divorces but if it was three divorces then there's no returning back until she marries someone else uh, and they have relations and then uh, they divorce but this is all without the intention to make this happen so some women they actually almost prefer a situation like this in which they and they're probably a minority few but I'm giving you from a real situation because this is not something to belittle women and stuff but there are some women out there who actually want to enjoy just tasting the fruit of a new man and then but their intention because they have children or whatever the situation is they want to go back to their uh, initial husband so this is a very dangerous scenario and this follows under this curse that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam mentioned so Imam bin Uthaymeen Rahimullah Ta'ala mentioned that there are two conditions for this uh, for a woman to be made lawful for her first husband for a woman to be made lawful for her first husband meaning that if a husband and wife they divorce and the woman has been divorced this is the third divorce there's no coming back there's no fourth there's no fifth there's no sixth basically these two conditions have to be in place in order for them to ever be back together the first condition is that there has to be a sound nikah a a real authentic marital uh, uh, marriage she has to be married again to someone another man uh, another Muslim man 
And so it has to be an authentic nikah. It has to be a real, uh, a real marriage. It cannot be fitting under the description of this hadith being the one who is cursed, meaning that the one whose intention is to go back to their original, their first husband. She can't, it's not a game. It's very serious nikah. So the first condition is that the marriage is sound, that they have a sound marital bond. And the Sheikh mentions, he says, بِأَنَّ يَكُونْ نِكَاءَ رَغْبَ He said that this is, and, and what constitute this sound marriage is not just the marital contract and all the other conditions and a wali and, and so forth, and the atlan or the announcement or uh, the witnesses, but what he is referring to here as a authentic or sound nikah meaning that there's rugba, meaning that there is a desire that she is actually has an intention to marry someone else it's a new suitor it's a new marriage her life has moved on she is getting married to someone else she has the desire to do that okay she has the des desire to to make this work to make it a real marriage not in order to be back with her first husband uh or just for desire. So the Sheikh mentioned, and that falls under the two examples I gave. Uh, so he says, Wala nika muta. So it's not just for a temporary marriage, for enjoyment. For a time period. Like, okay, marry me for one week because I want to get with my first husband. You know, or she may not even mention that. But it should not be, it should not fit under any of those scenarios. It needs to be an authentic, real nikah where she actually has a desire to marry uh, this new Muslim man. Otherwise, the nikah is facet, meaning is later sahih, meaning it is not a legitimate marriage if she does with the intention to uh, be with her other husband. Because the Prophet ﷺ cursed those ones. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Men amana amana laysa alayhi amrana fuwarad. Whoever does something in this affair of ours will have it rejected. And so Ben Othaymin uses that to mention that uh, because this is an innovative practice, this is a, a practice which is not from Islam, this is a pre-Islamic custom, that this uh, is rejected, meaning that the act, the marital contract, is not sound, is not sahih. So that's what is meant uh, here. The second condition for the woman making herself lawful for her uh, uh, original husband is that he has relations with her, sexual in sexual intercourse, not just other aspects of enjoyment, but rather they actually have uh, sexual relations. That he int that is sexual intercourse, and this is evidence from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we can have Karim about this scenario. Qala subhana fa in talakaha fala tu hillahu mimbadu hatta tankiha zojin ghaira. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Baqarah in verse two hundred and thirty that if he divorces her then uh, she is not lawful for him until he marries, uh, I mean, until she marries uh, another husband. Another husband. And so the evidence from this ayat is coming from the statement of Allah when Allah says, Tan kiha zojin, meaning uh, she marries. A mar a, 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 another husband or a, a, a husband meaning a new uh, husband and some of the scholars they mention uh, or, or that the uh, the meaning here of marrying another husband means uh, a what means uh, sexual relationship because nikah in the Arabic language it also has the meaning uh, as a Sharia term we, we usually refer to it as nikah is usually meant for the marital contract 
Nikah also means sexual relations. It also has that meaning. So, here the meaning in this ayat is sexual relations. It isn't just that they make another marital contract, then she, she then they divorce and she can be lawful for her husband. La. Because we know this tafsir from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what he meant. And so what's meant in this ayat, in this ayat, and this is in accordance with the sunnah and the correct tafsir. And also, this is known from the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala as well. That what's meant here is that as sexual relations in this uh, this statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So meaning that uh, those two conditions that need to be in place in order for the woman to go back to her initial husband first is that they have a sound uh, marriage, okay, that they that she has the desire to actually get married to this individual, not to in order to be with her first husband, not in order just to sample some new fruit and try something new and then go back to her old husband. No. But the intention needs to be a sound nikah in order to, uh, you know, that, that there she's getting married to someone, she actually desires to actually be married to them, to, to make a real marriage. And the second condition is what? Is that they actually have uh, sexual intercourse. And then, of course, they divorce. You know, they happen to divorce. So this is what makes it permissible really all of those three those are the two conditions that imam mentioned and of course it goes without saying that also that they ended up divorcing after that so you could basically say three things uh take uh, have to be in place one that they have a sound marriage she's made a sound marriage to someone else and they had uh, they had sexual relations at least once and then they ended up divorcing okay for whatever reason and then she is open to marriage and she's able to if her her first her first husband uh, that she had divorced from three times wishes to marry her and she wishes to be back with him then they can get married so it needs to be those uh, three those conditions in place and that makes it differ different uh, that differs from the scenario the Prophet ﷺ is describing in the Hadith about the the people who are cursed. Another mas'ala that comes up with this Hadith is that the scholars also differ about the situation of the when when the uh, if if the the woman goes back to her first husband, what does that mean? Their new nikah, now they are married with no divorces, or does that mean it was actually when she goes back to her initial husband, she uh, she uh, it's on the divorce that they left off on. For example, a woman, uh, a husband and wife say if they divorce twice, and then her idda transpired, and she she married someone else. Uh, she married someone else. They had relations, and then they ended up divorcing for some reason, and then she decides she wants to marry her first husband again. Then if they marry. One uh, view of the ulama is that if they marry, it uh, gets rid of all the, the prior uh, divorces. Meaning that, huh, they start from scratch, they are now, uh, they're married, this new uh, nikah, and that second nikah got rid of all the divorces. So now they are a newly married couple with three divorces between them. If they, if they happen to divorce they uh, up to three times like a fresh newlywed couple another view of the ulama is that that if uh, the same scenario except that they would actually because they were it was on the second it will go back to the second uh, divorce 
meaning that now they've remarried again. Uh, she's went back to her first husband, and they had had only one talak between them uh, left. So now they go back, and they have uh, they go back to where she left, where they left off, basically, and it will be. Uh, uh, one one divorce left or as if that divorce uh, did not happen and they would go back to one to one talaq okay and so and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best there are evidences for these uh, aqwal and I'm inclined to say and it, it makes more sense and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best that uh, the opposite of what Imam bin Uthaymin, he takes the view of the madhab of Imam Ahmed, which it does not get rid of uh, those divorces. Instead, it goes back to, for example, in the scenario we mentioned, it would go back to they would have one talaq between them left. Or if that was a second divorce, that divorce would be dis discounted and they would they would have uh, two divorces left I believe so meaning one had only one you know would have transpired but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best for the delil for that for the evidence for that so I'm inclined to to take the other statement of the ulama which I believe is uh, more in accordance with the majority of the ulama that the uh, that it gets rid of all the prior uh, talaq, all the prior talaqat, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Those are just some of the issues from that hadith. In the next hadith, the next hadith narrated uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala, and Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, A man guilty of fornication who has been flogged for it should not marry any but a woman like him similarly guilty. Reported by Ahmed and Abu Dawood and its narrators are reliable uh, fiqh. Uh, in this hadith, it means that a pious man should not marry a woman guilty of adultery or fornication. And a pious woman should not marry a man guilty of adultery or, uh, or fornication. So that's the very simplest meaning of this hadith. Is that people should be similarly... Uh, compatible in in this regard you know as far as the the uh, their their righteousness or what have you and however what's what's very important to mention as uh, Ben Othaymin mentioned this big benefit is that of course if this person has made Toba they have made they've sought forgiveness because often in many of the much of the world these punishments aren't implemented and if someone if this scenario happens so for example especially in the west and non in where muslim minorities in, in non-muslim countries you don't have those uh sharia principles and punishments and and that uh often the scenario is uh, there's often many cases where Someone who is known for committing zina marries someone who could be a virgin or something similar to this, or they're both non-virgin, or whatever the case may be. The point being is the sh the the point being is not it's not that just the punishment, but it's more that there has been toba. If this person has removed themselves from that then in that situation, then a righteous man could marry a woman who had previously been known or had committed zina and she made toba, an, an honest, sincere toba. And this will be between her and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hopefully that the behavior will illustrate that, that she had left that uh, practice. And from the benefits of this hadith, one of the main one of the main benefits is the impermissibility 
of uh, marrying a person who is an adulterer to a person who is righteous or who has not committed zina, a virgin, or what have you, unless, uh, uh, except in the situation, unless they've made toba, as we mentioned. And Ben Othemin explains, and this evidence for this, this comes from basically the fifth, he said, and because this is from the description uh, of Toba, meaning that the, the description is now this individual who has made Toba, who has made repentance for having committed adultery or fornication, that the fact that they made Toba, they are no longer considered an adulterer or a fornicator. So this removes that fornication and that adultery. So they're now described, you describe them as a person who is not a fornicator. You don't say he's a fornicator because he, he left that. He left that and he made Toba. Now this bird, he's known for righteousness, or this woman is now known for righteousness. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows the sharia protects the mannerism, showing that zina and fornication, that these are mithmun, these are sinful practices, and that uh, the one who commits them is not showing regard for the daughters of the people they've committed this action with or what have you so that they they don't have importance to this very important uh, part of mannerisms and part of uh, being straight and on istiqama which is maintaining one's uh, chastity uh, and so forth another benefit of this hadith is that that it is an obligation to prevent someone who is known for adultery to marry someone who is uh, who is a righteous person. That this should be prevented. This should not be the scenario. Uh, this scenario should be prevented. And so again, uh, some of these things are a bit difficult. To practice, especially in a not, you know, when it's difficult to prove if someone has committed zina or something. But people who are well known for this, if someone is well known and it comes to an imam, then they have that uh, ability to say, I'm not going to perform the marriage because this, unless it is known that you've made a sincere repentance or what have you. So those are just some of the benefits of this uh, hadith, uh, of these two hadith of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And in the last hadith of this chapter, the 854th hadith, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, a man divorced his wife by three pronouncements, and another man married her and divorced her before cohabiting with her. Then her first husband intended to remarry her and asked Allah's Messenger وسلم, about that. He said no until the other one, the second husband, has enjoyed your asal or your honey with her as the first husband had. And the wording is Sahih Muslims. In this hadith, this hadith is similar to the uh, other hadith of this uh, this chapter, uh, referring to the importance of a woman after being married uh, and divorced from her first husband, and if it is the irrevocable divorce that she must be remarried and remember we mentioned three conditions one is that she has a sound uh, nikah so she has a sound remarriage she remarries with the intention we we also mentioned that uh, this sound marriage what denotes that it's a sound marriage is that she has the intention to come back to her husband I mean uh, I'm sorry the intention to marry this new husband 
that she should not be have an intention that she's going to go back to her previous husband. It should be a pure marriage that she has a real legitimate Nia, a real legitimate uh, intention to marry uh, this, uh, this new suitor. And secondly, that the uh, that the in the new marriage that actually the marriage is consummated. So if we look at this hadith, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, which verifies for us that hukum, that ruling, which condition does it violate? The first one or the second one? Of course the second condition. And the second condition is what? The second condition is that the uh, woman and her new husband must cons the new husband must consummate the marriage. They must have sexual uh, relations. So very very important that those con two conditions are in place. And this is what this hadith affirms for us. This hadith affirms that hukum that we were mentioning. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, as in, uh, if we look at the Arabic wording here, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. Uh, after he was asked, he said, he said, لا حتى يذوق الآخر من عسيلتها ما ذاك الأول. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, what means if we were to literally translate this, or even the figurative, because it is it is a type of figurative speech. He says, no, meaning that she can't marry her new wife, her new husband, her her prior husband, her first husband, she can't return to him until the new husband, you know, their second marriage, has tasted her asal. And asal is Arabic. Uh, as, asal is Arabic for honey. It is the Arabic word for honey, asal. And asal or is one of the words for honey. And uh, asila, this is the construction of that Arabic noun asal, uh, using it in its, um, I won't say the short form, but this is the, in Arabic it's called uh, ism tasghir. It means to make something uh, to talk about something in a like it's shorter the miniature version so to speak for for lack of a better term so asal is uh, means honey asil or asil means this is a short this is like you would almost if you wanted to translate to say a little honey or that it's uh, uh, for example also in Arabic they say kelb or kila or, or, or kulayib kelb or kulayib kelb means dog kulayib means a small dog it's called ism tasghir it means you're making you're drawing out the name and it's like saying uh, almost like for a puppy although there's another word for a puppy uh, if you say uh, uh, they're, they're, you know, the, the Arabs, they use this uh, for, for many things. For example, in Arabic also, kitab, this is a book, kitab. And they say, kutayib. Kutayib means it's not a book. It's like a small book or it's a small risala or it's really a pamphlet. So this is, 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 is the terminology the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, used ism tasghir for the word asal, for honey. And what's very important here, and why I focused on this in the explanation of this hadith, as we're, we'll see, is that one of the things that was common and is common for in, in the Arabic language, especially in classical Arabic, in Fusha, and especially regarding the Sharia, especially regarding uh, I Islamically, is that the Arabs, <coughs> uh, they... And, and we find this a lot from the Prophet that 
it's a part of their manners to use uh, what's called uh, like a kunya or a metaphor or something to describe something out of shyness. For example, instead of, uh, as it's translated and we'll find, and, and the meaning is sexual intercourse, but the way the Prophet Sallallahu said it in the original Arabic text referred to honey or you know in the in the short form as we mentioned ism tasghir to sh and it's a way of describing something instead of being very brunt and abrupt in the language and saying sex or sexual intercourse in karamakum Allah instead from his adab from his manners he referred to it as, as something else which the meaning was understood from that okay and and, and we do this in english as well but I, it's, I'm at a loss right now of, of some English examples. But the, in the Arabic, uh, this is used a lot. It's tukenni. It's using like a kunya or using sort of, you could say, a nickname or a metaphor to describe something. Uh, uh, to, to describe something uh, that might be controversial or something that might be... Uh, you know, it's just a form of mannerisms for dealing with something that could be a strong subject matter. So the Prophet ﷺ used that in this hadith. This hadith, as we studied those other hadith prior to this, this hadith has many benefits and we talked about most of the benefits. The primary benefit that we want to discuss here uh, that are mentioned, uh, the first benefit is related to what I just said about the to the kunya or to give something a nickname and that is uh, to give something uh, to, to talk about something metaphorically or maybe in uh, as an analogy or something something that brings about shyness and in this case it was sexual intercourse so from this hadith we understand the permissibility and that this is a good thing and that this was a practice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't come out and just say sexual intercourse, but rather he made this, uh, he used this type of uh, kunya or this way of making a metaphor so that the same thing was understood without saying it in a, uh, a very straightforward and way that illustrated a lack of shyness. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that if a woman, it, it affirms for us that the hukum, if a woman has irrevocable divorce with her first husband and then she remarries, that she must, uh, she must fit those two conditions that we mentioned, that she has a sound intention in the new marriage to actually be married and make it work and number two that she has actual sexual relations and that's why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that because she wanted to return back to her first husband she wasn't maybe she wasn't pleased you know in the hadith uh, and this is the hadith of Aisha a man divorced his wife by three pronouncements so then it was the irrevocable divorce and another man married her and divorced her before cohabiting with her. So she may not have had the intention of uh, to be do, do the um, the mahal, uh marriage to to do the marriage where she made herself lawful for her husband. Instead, she may have had a real intention, but they did it. They found some things in one another's character or what have you, and they decided to divorce. They didn't even consummate. So she wanted to, she intended to remarry her husband. Because it says here, then her first husband uh, intended to remarry her and asked Allah's Messenger وسلم, about that. He said, no, until the other one, meaning the second husband, uh, you know, has enjoyed her, her honey or has had relations with her. So that lets us know those two conditions must be in place. And in this hadith, this hadith, Perhaps, and we don't know the full context of the hadith, it could perhaps mean that 
either they had the intention to make muhallal, but it doesn't appear to be from this, from from what was stated. So, regardless, it illustrates for us those two fundamental foundations, especially the second one, that even if they had the correct intention, that they did not want to, she did not intend to go back with their first husband, but her and the new husband separated before having second, second sexual relations, it shows us that that condition is an obligation for her to do so, that she had to actually have sexual intercourse with the uh, second husband, okay, that this is just the hukum, and this was in accordance with what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. So this lets us know that it is not permissible for the wife to go back to the first husband uh, without having had sexual relations. The third benefit of this hadith uh, is that that regardless of, for example, someone's intention for something, if they don't do it in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is an act of ibadah we're talking about, uh, you know, or something related to a hukum shari, then uh, that act will be rejected. And so this hadith also illustrates for us, because although the woman may have had a good intention, and she really wanted to marry, uh, and she married this man and everything was proper and she had intention to be married to him but then they found some things between them that they didn't like and they decided to divorce even before they consummated that that wasn't sufficient because they didn't follow the full, full sunnah and the full hukum, hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which it would have been for them to consummate before she was able to remarry her first husband so this shows us that uh, that those two conditions, the two conditions for having your deeds accepted even, are first that your intention is for Allah, that you're doing the act of ibadah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to worship Allah, to baraka ta'ala alone, and secondly, uh, that it's in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.